That idea about, you know, the, the Australian curriculum was about um, making sure that kids could move from state to state and, you know, that, that, that was really, that really isn't the point. That really isn't the strategic intent of the Australian curriculum. And there's a danger that we think, well, we've had the Australian curriculum for a while now, isn't, isn't this all too late? Well, I don't think it is. In fact, I think it's perfectly timed. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, whenever we do something new, when it, whenever we innovate, whenever something new happens, the only thing you can do is to engage with it to surface level. You know, when you start, you, you deal with the surface stuff and then you get to know it. And then you can go deeper with it. And then you can really get into um, a more sophisticated understanding of it. So I think we've got our familiarity now with the Australian curriculum. And now is the perfect time for that next step. Um, thinking about the, the point, you know, we were doing this work... Um, we've been doing this work in South Australia, thinking about you know, how we're going to make the Australian curriculum work for us. I think in some places, people are becoming, uh, in other states and territories perhaps, people are becoming slaves to the Australian curriculum. It's the curriculum that's kind of driving um, the, the pedagogy, driving the values in all kinds of strange directions and away from what educators are valuing. And for me, it's been really interesting, you know, thinking about... Um, that, you know, that video clip that we've seen of, of Ken Robinson, um, that animated clip about changing education paradigms, you know, that's, been, that's been around for a while and we've been looking at that for a while. But for a long time, it strikes me that it's just been rhetoric. Right? We've all been able to watch it and go, oh yeah, great. But it's not really, as, a, as systems, we've not really incorporated that thinking into our practice and into our policies. But I think now it's changing. I think now we can really see that it's changing, that, that that rhetoric is turning into action. I've been involved in this project with uh, UNESCO, looking at the future of education beyond 2015 for the whole Asia Pacific region. And that's really, that's been really interesting to me, looking at the parallels between what's going on in Australia and South Australia and what's going on in the whole region. You know, meeting the people from, from places like Bangladesh has just blown me away. You know, they've got, they've got a primary school system that's got 16 million kids in it. Wow, you know, how do you deal with that? And they're trying to get a computer into every school. And, and they've not got roads to some schools. So how do you get a computer? You know, and other, some schools, you know, they talk about internet access. Some of the schools haven't got power. You know, there's no electricity. So, you know, what are you going to do with your computer when you've got it? They've got, some, they've got some big challenges going on. But what's been interesting is the way that they respond to those challenges. 20 years ago, of the students that left high school, the students that completed high school, 5% of them were female. Now it's 50%. That's amazing, I think, that in such really a relatively short period of time, what they've done is they've said, this is our strategic intent and we are going to make this happen. And they're making it happen. And now this shift that we're talking about in terms of, you know, what's going on in education, what does the future of education look like? All around the Asia Pacific region, they're going, Right, we can see where we're going. Let's get on and make it happen. And yeah, they've got challenges, but they're up for, the, for, for meeting that challenge. The concern for me is that in Australia, we've been, we have been and still are really good at education. You know, world-class education. We export our education one way or another, whether it's about people coming here to be educated or it's about you know, our curricula and other things being exported to other, to other countries. But the danger is that we'll, we sit back on our laurels and we say, you know, we're great. Because if we sit back and stop, what will happen is the rest of the Asia Pacific region, and the rest of the world will just carry on building this momentum and just rush past us. And now I think that that's the, the kind of big picture challenge for us. At this, um, at this work we're doing with the UNESCO, one of the people that's involved is a guy called Dirk van Dam, who's the head of education at the OECD. So he's responsible for you know, the PISA study, looking at comparing 15-year-olds all around the world and their research. <laughs> you know, when I thought, I'm sure you did as well, when I heard, heard Dirk's name, Dirk Van Dam, you know, what I was thinking was I was going to go there and he's going to, this is, <laughs> this is who I was going to meet. And, um, and it's a bit, bit, bit of an irony, really, because this is what he looks like. So he's, uh, <laughs> but look, no, he's a, but he's a great thinker, you know, he's a great bloke and a great thinker. And one of the things that really struck me about his work, so these are his, his slides that he made publicly available. One of the things that struck me about his work was the clarity about what's actually happening in terms of this shift from industrial education to post-industrial. 
so that those clips from Ken Robinson and others kind of build the build a story for us. But Dirk was saying, this is what it looks like. This is the difference. The industry, if we think about skills and pedagogy, that industrial notion is around, you know, uh, routine skills, curriculum centered, linear concepts of learning compared to that post-industrial um, those post-industrial characteristics of learning that are around non-routine skills, non-linearity, the difference between you know, discipline in the industrial system and building character as a learner within the post-industrial system. We have all kinds of problems with the language about cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills. Um, the, another person who's involved is the person who's the head of the uh, National Science of Learning Centres in the UK, in the US, the six of them. And as soon as Dirk finished talking, she and I went up to him and said, hang on, those are cognitive skills. You know, what he's calling non-cognitive. There's a bit of a confusion in this. There's lots of literature around it. Really what he's talking about when he talks about cognitive skills in the industrial area is things like, you know, intelligence IQ and that kind of subject-specific learning. Whereas the cognitive and non-cognitive skills, he's saying, well, that learning is still important, but the non-cognitive are the things about, you know, decision-making, prioritising. You know, if they say, what, what's one of the characteristics that's the difference between a, an OK apprentice and a fantastic apprentice? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? What's the difference between them? You might think about things like anticipation. That, you know, they've both got a set of skills. They've both been taught a certain set of skills. But the apprentice who can anticipate the problems, the apprentice who can see what's coming, what might be around the corner, that's the difference between the fantastic apprentice. And that's what I think Dirk would call um, non-cognitive skills. I call it cognitive. So there's a bit of a, a, bit of a thing about, the issue, about what we're talking about. But I think you can see those sorts of skills. The planning, prioritising, the decision-making, the um, negotiating skills, a whole host of things around that. Um, we could pick out, a, uh, you know, we could talk about each one of these in detail. I think the last one is really important, the idea of pedagogy for selection of few versus pedagogy for selection of, for success of all. I think, that's a, I think that's a really big shift. I think universities are really grappling with that shift at the moment. One of the things that universities have done in the past is to say, you know, c come in and if you get through the first year, that's great. And if you don't, well, you've learned something, you know, good on you, off you go. You know, and that's just not that's just not acceptable anymore. That idea that we've got this kind of funnel model of education. That I think in the South Australian context, I found it really interesting. Just very briefly to touch on this, this idea about the organ the way in which we organise education, and the changes that are going on in South Australia. You know what a whatever education organisation looks like next year. Um, I think that some of these ideas about the shift from bureaucratic control to devolved local responsibility. Um, building capacity at the point of delivery and really recognising teachers as professionals and building on that idea of teachers as professionals. When I'm hearing that this is going on, you know, at the OECD level, at the, at the Asia Pacific level, and I also hear it going on in South Australia, that there's this real opportunity for us to, to, to enact this shift in Australia and, and particularly in South Australia. Just lastly on Dirk's slides, excuse me, lastly on Dirk's slides, um, the, the point at the top there about education provision in the industrial area and supported learning post-industrially. So these are my thoughts on that now. Um, what, what, I'm, what I was thinking there, what I'm, I'm seeing there is that that idea of, um, we talk about opportunity a lot, and I don't think opportunity is enough. You know, it used to be that, you know, there was a kind of, an entitlement to be taught and again in universities we do it very well because what we do is we get 200 kids and we say you've got this opportunity to learn I'm going to stand here and I'm going to talk at 200 of you and you know and, and you'll learn through doing that uh, and then come back tomorrow and we'll do it again and then again and then again and there are all these learning opportunities that's just not enough um, opportunity of instruction is a false opportunity because if you're not if the educator is not driving you through those opportunities if the educator is not be doing active teaching to make sure that you are getting the intended learning and that you're building, you're developing as a learner, then that's, then that's not enough. So I think there's a real distinction between the kind of teaching entitlement that perhaps we used to think about and now what we think about much more is the learning entitlement. It's my job to make sure that my students are learning. It's not my job to just teach at them, that they're not um, the, the kind of passive recipients of my teaching. So I think, uh, so that whole picture of 
um, that rhetoric of the shift in education that we've had for a long time, I think we're actually enacting now. I think the Australian curriculum is our opportunity to enact it. And we can't just sit back and let the Australian curriculum happen to us. We've got to take control of it. We've got to do that active engagement, that strategic engagement with, um, the, uh, with the Australian curriculum to make sure that we can actually enact this industrial to post-industrial transition. So let me just zoom in on a, on, a, on a couple of things. This idea of evidence-rich teaching environments, teaching and learning environments in particular, and this idea of pedagogy of success for all. Oh, what does that mean? What does the evidence tell us about what that, that means? There's a couple of things that really struck me in terms of the, some of the literature over the last year or so. This came out um, about 12 months ago. A review of what it is about school that predicts university success. Now, if we were to ask our question, ourselves a question, what's school education for? We wouldn't say university, you know, university success, we wouldn't say the next step. But it's an interesting thing to look at, I think. In this review, what they did was they took 7,000 articles and looked at um, the correlations between what is it about that you leave school with that actually predicts or correlates with your grade point average at university. And they produced a diagram that looks like this, and we'll, we'll zoom in on the diagram, I know you can't read it. What basically what it's saying is, on the right hand side, the further you are to the right, the bigger the impact of that characteristic or that outcome of your schooling, the bigger the impact on your grade point average at university. If you're on the, that line, that uh, vertical line in the middle, um, that's a zero effect, has no effect. And on the left hand side, that's a negative effect on something that you developed at school, some characteristic that you've got that has a negative effect on your performance at university. And so if we, you know, if we zoom in on a few of those, hopefully you can see on the right hand side, there are things, the things that are far out to the right are things like self-efficacy. Students thinking, if I put this effort, being able, thinking along the lines of, if I put this effort in, I'll be able to reach that, that goal that I've got. I'll be able to, you know, bump up a grade. It's, it's under my control. I can do it. I can put the effort in. I can do it. I know where to get the learning. I know how to do that. Um, that sort of thinking leads to, predicts, um, better outcomes at university. I think if we, what's interesting is if we put on top of that some of the data about, you know, you can see at the bottom there, intelligence, that's much lower. School grades. University entry score. You know how much I hate university entry scores. <laughs> I think that, you know, I really think they're not fit for purpose the way that they work. It's interesting, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before, that the university entry scores all around the world, the UK, the States, Australia, all correlate really well with each other. And they also correlate with the drop in the ruler test. And if you get a ruler and drop it between somebody's fingers and see how many centimetres it drops before they grab it, they correlate with that. So we don't need this university entry system. All we need is all our school leavers and a ruler, and we'll be right. You know, we get the same sort of we get the same sort of distribution of scores. So, so what we're seeing is so what we can actually what I'm getting at is we can actually start to see what it is about schooling, what it is about our kids that predict at least university performance. As we go down and we start to see things like, uh, down the, just down the list, we start to think, see things like grade goal. And that's not about saying, I want an A. It's about saying, OK, I'm here and I'm consistently getting Cs and I'm going to push for a B. I'm gonna, I've, I've got this goal and I'm working towards the, that. Um, and effort regulation as well. And I think these are partly captured by this idea of a strategic approach to learning. I think that's fascinating that a strategic approach to learning is as influential, if not more influential, than things like your grades at school and your, um, and your IQ and intelligence. So when I'm looking at this paper, I think I'm fascinated by that, this idea of this strategic approach to learning. I'm thinking, well, what if you've not got a strategic approach to learning? You know, that's not going to help you at all. And I was expecting to see that on the zero line. But look, there's the zero line going through the, the picture there. And the surface approach to learning is actually over on the left hand side. A surface approach to learning, a just going through the motions of learning, doesn't have no effect. It has a negative effect. It pulls you back. It doesn't stop you moving forward. It pulls you back. It drives you in a backwards direction. I think that's fascinating. I think that that, that, that shift between the industrial to the post-industrial is really coming out of um, this um, Th this sort of evidence that that stuff about you know in science Dennis Goodwin we put the science together said we're not calling it content we're calling it understandings 
because we want the students to actually understand it. This is an active process. It's not about sitting back and soaking it up. The Australian curriculum is much more about active learning. That's part of the strategic intent and is going to demand much more active teaching. That surface approach to learning point, uh, you know, if you draw a line through it, the only things that are as or more um, damaging to students' outcomes at university, you might not be able to read it. At the top there is procrastination. Who knew that was going to be a bad thing? And, um, and, and then in the middle there to the left of that uh, orange line is test anxiety. You know, so that thing that stops you performing because you go, you know, I can do it, I can do it. And then you get in the test and, ah, and, it all, and it all falls to pieces. They're the only things that in all of these characteristics, these 50 characteristics that they picked out that are more damaging um, than that surface approach to learning. So, you know, we can bang on. There's loads, 7,000 studies in this, loads of research looking at what about the kids who go to university. But what about the kids who leave school without any qualifications? What is it about school that predicts their outcomes? There's not so much on this. This is one paper that's, I think, kind of representative of the, of the little bit of research that's out there on this. And what they did was they looked at people who were, in, who were employed after school, who had left school without any qualifications, and said, well, what is it that makes a difference? What is it that predicts whether people can move up within their organisation, you know, can get those more economically um, beneficial uh, jobs. And as you can, see, you can see there it says that they found that higher levels of self-directedness in learning correlated with a higher chance of being promoted within an organisation. Higher levels of self-directedness in learning. These are kids who left school without any qualifications. But the difference between them and the people who didn't move up the organisation was their self-directedness in learning. I'm getting that strategic approach to learning message again, coming out of this, um, coming out of this uh, research as well. 